Good afternoon. I'm Mark Greenfield. As chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I'd like to welcome you to the seventh program in our noon lecture series this quarter. Today's guest began his political career at the age of 25 and at 34 was elected to represent Indiana in the United States Senate. Senator Bayh has distinguished himself as one of the Senate's outstanding constitutional authorities. As chairman of the Constitutional Amendment Subcommittee, he wrote and guided to passage the 25th Amendment to the Constitution on presidential succession. He is the leading legislative figure in the effort to abolish the Electoral College and is a strong supporter of 18-year-old voting. Most recently, Senator Bayh led the anti hainsworth forces in the Senate. It is with pleasure that I introduce Senator Birch Bayh. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, members of the faculty and student body of UCLA, it's a privilege for me to have the chance to be here with you this, uh, this afternoon and to share some of my thoughts. That's what I'd like to do, if I may, uh, spend a little time uh, discussing uh, an issue or two that is of critical concern to me, and hopefully at least to some of you, relative to one of my official capacities as chairman of the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments, and then uh, uh, slide into whatever you would like to discuss in the question and answer period uh, to follow. I must say that um, in uh, anticipating uh, my remarks, I wondered what uh, format I should follow, and I finally decided that perhaps the best admonition uh, to follow would be to heed a suggestion that was given to me a couple of years ago when I arrived at a small high school in southern Indiana to give a commencement address. And as I pulled in about a half an hour early in, the, in my car and pulled up to the front door, I a very charming young lady in a long white dress rushed out and opened the door and said, are you Senator Bayh? And I said, uh, yes, I am. She said, I'm, ho I'm your hostess. Would you follow me? And I looked at her and said, well, if you insist. And uh, she uh, proceeded to escort me down the, to the auditorium and right down through the center aisle. And they had five steps up the center of the stage. And she took this poor old decrepit senator's arm and gingerly helped me up the steps and put me in the seat of honor in the center of the stage. And then just before she left, she put her lips very close to my ear and said, K-I-S-S, -S, Senator. Well, um, <laughs> I, uh, I struggled to regain my composure and uh, managed to get through the speech. And we managed to graduate the senior class. And, after it was all over, being only human, I couldn't resist the temptation to brag just a little bit, so I sought out the president of the senior class, who was a dynamic young man. He was about six feet four, weighed over 200 pounds. In addition to being president of the senior class, he was also a straight-A student, had been captain of the football team. He was, he was participating in almost anything and everything that happened there, and I sought him out, and I'm sure as I walked up to him, I must have had my chest out like this, and I said, John, I want you to know that... Uh, the senator may be getting a few years on him, but he hadn't lost his old pizzazz. Well, John gave me this type of look, you know, and, and said, what is it, senator? And I said, well, it's very simple. This sweet, tender young thing that you assigned as my hostess wanted a kiss from the senator. Well, you could just sort of see the color go out of John's face, you know. He didn't know whether to tell it as it is or try to find some way to escape. And finally, he summoned up all of his courage, stood his full six feet four, looked me squarely in the eye and said, well, Senator, sir, I think you need to know, sir, that down in this part of the state, sir, K-I-S-S -S means keep it short, stupid. And uh, <laughs> with, that, with that admonition, I thought uh, being very appropriate then, Frankly, I didn't think it was very funny, but I think it's appropriate. But uh, I thought perhaps that's the best uh, format to follow here uh, this afternoon. I've had the good fortune uh, to visit with students on a great number of campuses over the last seven years, and I make no apologies for the fact that uh, of the many responsibilities that uh, we in the Senate have, that this is the most enjoyable. It's the most enjoyable because I've found that if there is a group of citizens in this country that is able to articulate the problems and the frustrations that confront not only our country but civilization, it is indeed those who are presently on our campuses today. So I've been looking forward to this. 
If there's one question that I've been asked more than any other, it is the following question. Uh, Senator By, can this system, can this governmental system of ours, will it respond? Living in space age America in a space age world, do we have a form of government that will respond to the needs of our people, to the needs of mankind? All sorts of related questions. Can this system enact legislation, can we control ourselves in such a manner that we don't destroy ourselves? Basically, I, I think it's fair to say that in my judgment, the system can and will respond if, and that little word is a, always a pretty big one, but I think the system will respond if enough of ourselves will spend the time and energy we need working within the system. I would be the first one, having had the chance to, and I frankly think the good fortune to spend the last 15 or so years of my life working in various capacities of government. I'm the first one that would have to admit we have shortcomings in our system and don't try to hide those over at all, gloss them over at all. But uh, also having had the, the chance this uh, last fall during the three-week congressional recess to spend that entire period of time in the Soviet Union and both since and before having a chance to tour and, and to visit and to study most other parts of the world, I, I must say I, I wonder if we don't find ourselves in the same position that Winston Churchill found himself in shortly after World War II when there was an increased amount of criticism directed at the United States and at him as a leader of the majority in Great Britain. And finally he took about all of that he could and one evening rose on the floor of the House of Common and Commons and addressed himself to the critics in the back bench, and he said, I think my critics in the back bench are absolutely correct that the form of government in the United States is the worst form of government known to mankind, except any other form of government. I think we have to put our system in relativity with other systems, and uh, Thus, I say very frankly that I think those who feel that the best alternative is to destroy the system are, are headed in the wrong direction, that we ought to build on our strengths and perfect our weaknesses. And I would like to address uh, myself to and direct your attention to a couple of these weaknesses, recognizing them for what they are, but suggesting that there are practical means for shoring them up. One of the weaknesses deals with what I think should be, and perhaps is, the ultimate in self-determination, where free people gather together and choose their ultimate leader. I address myself to the problems of the electoral college system. The election of the President of the United States is indeed uh, the ultimate in which we choose the man who has more power than any other human being on the face of the earth. Yet when you look at the way this system actually works, you look at the inherent dangers, you can't help but be impressed with the difference between performance and reality, or potential reality. The American Bar Association addressed itself to this problem, really at our invitation some three or four years ago, and after a 10-month study by a rather illustrious, and I may say, uh, must say, heterogeneous from a political, philosophical, and regional standpoint, a heterogeneous group of experts, they came up with a rather ringing indictment of the Electoral College system. Pretty well summarized in one concluding sentence which went something like this. We feel that the Electoral College system is outdated, archaic, undemocratic, inequitable, and dangerous. Other than that, they didn't think there was too much wrong with the Electoral College system. And I thought I might take a minute or two to look with a greater degree of specificity at some of these weaknesses because this is the basic, one of the basic principles, one of the structural principles of our system. Undemocratic. Why is the system undemocratic? Well, very frankly, it's undemocratic because you and I don't vote for our president. We may think we do, but we never have. Some of our friends may brag about religiously going in every four years, never missed an opportunity to vote for their president, but they never have voted for their president. Most of us are aware now that we vote instead for electors, Unfortunately, few of our people know that electors exist and even fewer have ever met one personally or know one by name. To compound this problem, 
This undemocratic aspect, these electors in most states are completely free to ignore the mandate, the edict of the electorate on election day, disregard their orders and vote for any candidate they want to. To show you what we almost uh, confronted in 1968, let me just look at the facts of the matter. And this isn't James Michener writing some uh, theoretical and very interesting novel. These are the facts of life as they were in 1968. We came within 42,000 votes of not electing any man president of the United States on Election Day in 1968. Because if there had been a change of 42,000 votes, in fact, a little less than 42,000 votes in the right three states, neither Mr. Nixon nor Mr. Humphrey would have had a majority of the Electoral College vote. Thus, as you know, the decision, according to the Constitution, rests on the House of Representatives, where each state, California, Alaska, Rhode Island, New York, large and small, gets one vote and only one vote, unless you're so unfortunate as to live in a state where the congressional delegation is evenly divided, and then you don't get any vote at all. But in my judgment, uh, I suppose you'd call it, Mark, the Birch Bayh philosophy of 1968, uh, uh, I don't think the decision would have been made in the House of Representatives. I don't. Because there was another factor. A fellow by the name of George Wallace had secured the vote of 46 electors. And we have ample evidence now to lead us to believe that uh, the majority of these Wallace electors had signed affidavits in advance of the election, pledging to vote for whichever candidate Governor Wallace suggested they should support. So if we had been confronted with neither of our two major candidates having a majority of the Electoral College vote, we would have seen, in my judgment, George Corley Wallace going first to the Nixon camp and then to the Humphrey camp and back and forth saying, all right, gentlemen, here I have 46 electoral votes. They'll do what I tell them to do. What am I bid to make you president of the United States? And that would have been a sad chapter in the history of this country. I don't need to tell you the tremendous problem of faith that any president chosen that way would have had, not only at home, but abroad. So much for the undemocratic aspect of the system. What about the inequality of it? Why is it inequitable? Well, basically, it's because everybody that votes doesn't have the same potential opportunity to affect the outcome. To look at the mathematics of the Electoral College uh, uh, structure, you can find it right here on the West Coast. The, the greatest disparity in, in Alaska, one electoral vote represents about 75,000 people. In our least populous state, here in California, our most populous state, one electoral vote represents almost 400,000 people. Before you rush to the conclusion that this gives the small states a decided advantage, let me remind you that there's another little nuance, a little precedent that slipped in by the, by the back door because it is not in the Constitution, but it's practiced in all states and has the force and effect of law today called the unit rule. And as most of us know now, the unit rule says that a candidate gets the state's entire electoral block vote by carrying the state by the slightest popular vote, theoretically one vote. And because of this, the political leaders of both of our major parties know that if their candidate carries the 11 largest electoral vote states plus the smallest, in other words, if you carry those 12 states, by the slightest popular vote margin, it doesn't make any difference if you're soundly defeated in the other 38 in the District of Columbia, you're going to have enough electoral votes to be elected President of the United States. To give you an idea of, uh, of how unjust this can be, uh, let me share a thought that came to me right in the middle of a speech this last spring before a joint session of the Arkansas Legislature. I was going along about electoral reform, and I suddenly realized here in this beautiful and uh, ornate chamber in Little Rock, this was a body composed entirely of Republicans and Democrats. Yet every citizen in Arkansas that voted for either Humphrey or Nixon, Republican or Democrat, in 1968, not only lost their vote, but had it cast for George Wallace, who got just barely more than 38 percent of the popular vote of Arkansas, but got 100 percent of Arkansas's electoral vote under the unit rule. Now, this is hardly what you call justice in a day and age when I hope we're continuing to move toward equal opportunity and equal piece of the action for all of our citizens. The last shortcoming I'd like to touch on is the one that really worries me to the greatest degree, and that is the fact that the system has been called dangerous. And you may say, well, uh, why is it dangerous? Well, basically it's dangerous. The most dangerous aspect of it 
is the fact that the present system, the Electoral College system, does not guarantee that the man who wins is the man that has the most votes. Three times in our history we have elected a president who is not the popular vote winner on Election Day. There have been seven occasions, more recently in this century, since 1900, seven occasions where a change of less than one percent of the popular vote would have sent to the White House a man who was not the popular vote winner. We had a narrow escape in 1968. It was even closer in the popular vote count in 1960 when John Kennedy was elected. The greatest disparity between popular vote and electoral vote in modern history, I think, can be found in 1948 when we had a great deal of similarities. For some of you who may remember the 48 election, we had more than two principal candidates then. We had uh, Governor Dewey and President Truman. We also had a Wallace running in that election. The Wallace in 48 was a little bit left of the one in, in 68. Uh, we had a man by the name of Thurman who was running who picked up the general area of George Wallace support in the state's rights party. And when all the votes were cast, President Truman had, uh, had surprised the so-called experts and had won a rather astounding landslide victory of over two million votes. But what we may have forgotten is that if there had been a change of less than 30,000 popular votes in the right three large electoral vote states, less than 30,000 votes, Governor Dewey would have been elected president, not Harry Truman, despite the fact that Truman would have still had his two million vote plurality. Now, I suggest to you today, in this day and age, with the trials and tribulations which confront us in a troubled world, with the powers that reside on the president's shoulders being of the magnitude they are, it would be impossible for any man to be an effective president if he is not the choice of the governed. So much for shortcomings. You may say, Senator, it's easy to criticize, but uh, can you make it any better? I think so. I've been studying this for about five years, and I've pretty well established in my own mind a three-point criteria that any electoral reform should meet. First of all, I think everyone should directly participate in the decision. Everybody should have a direct personal relationship in choosing their president. Secondly, I think everybody should have an equal part of the action. Everybody's vote should have the same determinant in the final outcome. And third, of course, and of greatest importance to me uh, from a practical standpoint of faith in the system, I think any, any change should guarantee that the man who wins is the man that has the most votes. Now, you may quarrel with that criteria, but if you agree with that criteria, there is only one proposal that guarantees the three provisions that I suggest, and that is a direct popular vote. And it's for this reason that uh, I have been championing the direct popular vote for president for a number of years. I'm, I'm happy to be able to report that uh, there seems to be a growing feeling that this is the way to go. The House of Representatives uh, passed the, an identical bill to one I introduced about three years ago uh, by a 339 to 70 vote earlier this year. Shortly thereafter, the President of the United States, after some earlier equivocation, threw, threw his unqualified support behind the direct election proposal. This proposal in the uh, vehicle of SJ Res 1 is now uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee as the pending order of business. And hopefully, either later this year, within this next month, or at the very latest, early next year, this matter will be considered and passed out of the Judiciary Committee considered by the Senate. I think it's going to be close, but I, I hope uh, uh, we have uh, enough votes to pass it out there. I say I hope, basically let me say uh, I'm normally uh, an optimist, but having gone through this routine of constitutional amendments when we ratified the 25th Amendment, uh, I know how difficult it is to get two-thirds of both bodies and then to get three-fourths of the state legislatures. I think our most difficult battleground is going to be at the state legislature, where only 13 states can prevent this ratification of this much-needed change. So I suggest to, to those of you who share my concern that this change be effected, that there is plenty of need for you to speak out, to talk to your state legislators, indeed, uh, if you like, uh, to your senators. Uh, Senator Cranston uh, is one of the enthusiastic early supporters of, of SJ Res 1, uh, to uh, suggest to, to them that you feel this change is needed and to lend your weight and your influence to seeing that this system is going to respond. I feel uh, much more optimistic now than at any time in the past. Uh, George Gallup uh, took a poll shortly after election and found that 81% of the people 
uh, were in favor of direct popular election, which, uh, considering the very wonderful treatment that the press had given the full disclosure of the nuances of the system, I thought was, was very good. But I was even more pleasantly surprised to find out that when Dr. Gallup took a similar poll this last month, 81 percent of the people still, a year away from this election, 81 percent of the people still thought they ought to have a right to vote directly for their president. And I, I am still optimistic enough that when 81 percent of the people want something, when organizations like the American Bar Association, the Chamber of Commerce, the AFL-CIO, the UAW, the League of Women Voters is studying this, hopefully they'll come to a conclusion early next year that when we get this type of grassroots support evidenced in the need for change, that the system will change and will respond. I could talk about uh, others. Perhaps uh, some of you would like to pursue other uh, necessary reforms, uh, one of which would uh, be of primary interest to many of you here is the need to lower the voting age, which I have uh, been advocating for some time. I think uh, there's a real inequity there in saying to a young man that you can go over and risk having your head shot off in the jungles of Vietnam, but you can't use the, the mental processes to try to direct the, the direction in which our country is headed. The fact that uh, we have a million young people who are uh, are married and, and being participating in raising family, uh, taxpayers, uh, all of these inequities, it seems to me, are rather obvious. Plus the fact I think we're losing a lot of resources and young people who are, are really tuned off by being unable to participate in the system. And I think we can correct this by giving everybody an active part in the, in the system. Enough for that. Uh, that's the end of the filibuster. Now, what courses of action do you want to participate in? What, what direction do you want to go? Yes. I've been advised by Mark that there are a couple of microphones for those of you who want to be heard a little better and who aren't too modest. Uh, you're welcome to use them or I'll try to uh, interpret the question. I think the question was directed at why do we have in our amendment, which we do in SJRS 1, uh, a 40% runoff provision saying that you can be elected President of the United States so long as you get a plurality of the vote to no less than 40%. Why don't we, we require a uh, 50.01% pure majority. One of the basic concerns I had about going to the direct popular vote system was the fact that this could conceivably proliferate what has basically developed as a two-party political system in this country, which has lent, I think, a significant amount of stability to our political structure compared to multi-party states other places in the world. I didn't want to participate in a system that would tend to provide an incentive to proliferate. I didn't want to deny the opportunity for a new party to develop, but to create an incentive to proliferate the two-party system we now have, I thought would be headed the wrong direction. If you require 50.001 percent, a technical majority, and it is a close election, then a relatively insignificant party, say the American left-handed blue-eyed sign painters, uh, can accumulate enough votes, a handful of thousands, to prevent either one of the candidates from winning, the major candidates from winning, and then be in a position to sit down with one of the candidates afterwards and say, all right, let's make a little deal here. I'll throw my support to you in the runoff. Now, if you get down to, uh, uh, to a plurality president, the chances of being able to affect the outcome are uh, less great. And we've had many presidents who have been elected as minority presidents, who have still been plurality presidents, where we don't uh, question their credibility, their credentials. I mean, President Nixon, you may disagree with him, but nobody doubts the authenticity of his uh, support just because he got 42 percent of the vote. John Kennedy was a minority president. Uh, the, the thing that concerns me is not having a minority president, but not even having a plurality president, where you have fewer votes than one of your opponents, 
yet because of the nuances and the imbalance of the electoral system being elected president. Yes. Yes. Um, Senator Bai, um, I'd like to start off by <coughs> disagreeing with your analysis of the Electoral College system. Fine, you're not the first one. Go ahead. Good. And I suggest that if you want to see how stable your proposal will be, you might look at the history of France, Italy, and Greece. Um, however, I would like to speak about a, a real danger to the American system, a danger that I'm concerned about, and that is the military. Um, for the past four years, uh, I have been one of the few students that I know who have supported American strategic policy in Vietnam. Uh, my name is Charles Reed, and I've written for the Daily Bruin for the last four years, taking supportive stands. However, I have recently, within the last three weeks, completely altered my view of Vietnam for one reason, and that is the My Lay incident. Now, everybody here that's sitting in this auditorium paid to have those people killed. They paid for the military, and I think personally that General Westmoreland should be relieved of his command because for the very reason that uh, Nazi generals were put on trial during world, following World War II, uh, that reason uh, was that they, bear, uh, they were the ultimate responsible person for the actions which were committed uh, by the Nazis. Similarly, General Westmoreland and his chain of command bear the ultimate responsibility for whatever happened, for whatever atrocities were committed in Vietnam. However, my concern is ultimately, what are you going to do about it as a senator and as theoretically a representative of the people of the United States? Well, I want to suggest, first of all, the sort of the side slap you took at uh, the uh, direct election proposal and carrying uh, and comparing that with France. Uh, is not accurate because if you look at what happened in the last election with our 40 percent provision there would not have been a runoff the decision would have been made on election day and so it has been with the last two elections in france so it was with the uh, the uh, election in germany uh, there's no comparison if you want to look at the facts of the situation i was concerned about the instability as this young lady uh, asked a question and i tried to direct myself to that i think if you want to pursue it further there i can I think I can show you, you may not agree, but uh, at least uh, some reason to believe that the direct election proposal would create more stability because now the system really doesn't encourage getting out the most votes and everybody's vote doesn't count, uh, but in the direct election system it will. The, the atrocity to which you uh, refer is, is really a tragic chapter in American history. As, as a member of the Senate, I want to see that we get all the facts. I'm not sure we have all the facts now. I think that those who are directly responsible for this atrocity have to be punished. They have to be punished accordingly. As I stand here right now, I am not willing uh, to attribute the misdeeds of a lieutenant or a sergeant or a captain uh, to General Westmoreland. Now, if we find out that there was a cover-up there, then I think we have a, a different bill of goods. Uh, I, do, I do not believe, and I have taken issue with the military on several things. Uh, not the least of which was the anti-ballistic missile episode and then some of the other uh, unfortunate misallocation of priority as far as our resources are concerned. Uh, but I, I don't think you can say that the Milai situation is, is a calculated governmental policy such as existed in Nazi Germany. Uh, if we find out to the contrary in investigating this where the, uh, General Westmoreland or one of his subordinates I tried to cover this up, then I'd have to change my position. But right now, I, I say let's direct our attention at, at what we know and let's try to find out the whole story. I, I, I think we have to move quickly in this area, not try to hide anything, make a full disclosure, uh, suggest as emphatically as we can that this is not American policy. We don't intend for it to be American policy, but it's another chain, it's another in the chain of events that point out how tragic the Vietnam War is. Now, that's my opinion. According now, you have to a question? May, may I just no, make well, why don't we get the others, and then if, Excuse if somebody me. else wants to ask questions. Question over, here. Hmm? Oh, question over oh, here. Oh, far away. Right. Sir, I would like your opinion on an um, opinion poll recently taken in the southern states of the United States. And according to this poll, 98% would vote for Spiro Agnew if he ran for president. <laughs> Uh, 
And uh, I have another question. You know, that's really not very funny. <laughs> um, what is your opinion on um, holding national elections every two years instead of every four years as they now are held? Well, I personally feel that, uh, well, I've dealt twice now, I think, with the feeling that I have about the importance for stability. And uh, I feel that the four-year election tends to give stability, plus having the House of Representatives elected every two years, it tends to give the people the chance to express themselves in one of our branches of Congress if there's a dramatic shift between the presidential election and the next presidential election. Uh, I, I don't know what we accomplish. I must say I'm deeply concerned, uh, and I don't think this is solely because I just went through an election campaign in 1968, uh, but I'm deeply concerned in the amount of resources, the amount of finances, the amount of uh, emotional involvement that uh, the country spends in the election process. The cost of electing a president, the cost of electing a United States senator, the cost of electing a congressman has gone right through the ceiling. And I've been struggling with my thoughts and my staff's thoughts as to how we can do something about this. Uh, to double this expenditure in resources every two years, I'd, I'd be rather yes, reluctant to do that. Yes, I agree with you if you're saying that election processes should be computerized, and this would allow for them to be carried on. Um, quicker. Well, it's not, it's not the years, counting that elections. is costly, let me suggest. The counting uh, and the conduct of the election is not what's costly. It's all the money on television, on uh, uh, staff, on literature, all of the things that you know are, are involved in how you persuade uh, the average voter to vote for you. That, that's the cost that concerns me, not the actual cost of counting the votes Excuse or conducting me, sir, the election. I believe that's a side issue. Well, it may be. I'll let everybody determine that for themselves. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, I think uh, I don't have all of the statistics at, at hand, but if you compare the cost of counting and conducting the election, it pales into relative insignificance compared to the total costs of how you conduct a campaign. And it's uh, those costs that concern me. Yes. Or oh, we want to come back over here? Yes, uh, you, you were speaking about lowering the voting age. If trend. any of the rest of you want to sing out why far away, you don't have to come up here, but fine, yeah. Voting age to 18, and, and I would agree with you that this voting age is, is quite arbitrary. It's 21 right now. It could conceivably go up to 25, or we could have it at, at 45. Now, now, you said that a person should be allowed to vote at 18 because he goes to Vietnam and fights and he learns, you know, how to use a gun. That wasn't uh, the only thing I said, though, was it? Well, uh, supposedly a 17-year-old could, could volunteer and also go and fight. So, so fighting is, is not really the issue. Uh, if, uh, if, it, if, if it was, then, then we could argue about a 17-year-old vote, right? If, if it's not the issue, fighting is, is not the critical point, then why not lower it to 16 or, or 14 or 12? What would you say about a 12-year-old vote? Are you being serious or facetious? I, I'm being both. <clears throat> let, let me repeat what I said now. Let me repeat what I said, and then you can pursue the question if you want. I said I thought there was a tremendous amount of inequity in the fact that a man could be called upon to pay the supreme sacrifice and not have a voice in determining the policy of his country. I said I thought there was an inequity involved in the fact that you were paying taxes, you were being married and being a family raiser, and participating in the economy of the country and not being able to direct the policy that determines the economy of the country. But I said I thought it was more than that, that I thought we had a the even greater problem of losing resources, where young people were being turned off by the system because there wasn't any place for them where the action was. Well, and don't this is a matter that really concerns me. Don't don't sixteen-year-olds pay taxes and sometimes get married and get get disenchanted with well, the I system? Shouldn't that, uh, they vote? Why shouldn't a sixteen-year-old vote? Why even a cynic who is completely uh, cynical about the governmental process would have to suggest that perhaps the intellectual process is 
is at least partially something that should be considered. And is, for, is it better? Is it for better you for or someone else to suggest that uh, a 12-year-old uh, is uh, uh, equally capable with an 18-year-old? I'll let everybody make that determination for themselves. I think if you look at the educational standards of 19 and 20-year-olds, those that are graduated from high school, you can't help but be impressed with the fact that almost 80 percent, 80 percent, about 76 or 77 percent of the 19 and 20-year-olds today are either high school graduates or are in college, which is a higher level of intellectual attainment than any other age group has ever achieved. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I think that most of the questions that are asked in student audience are based on pretty sound intellectual grounds. <laughs> <clears throat> and you I, know, I, I, have, I have one, I, perhaps I shouldn't try a pragmatic argument on lowering the voting age to an audience of this type, but I want to be very honest with you. Uh, I do not uh, avoid pragmatism when it helps provide a worthy goal. And I think lowering the voting age is a worthy goal, and there are a lot of older citizens who will not buy the equity argument, will not buy the loss of resource argument. So I resort to a little pragmatic argument. And I point out very accurately, let me say, that the most far out student organizations, for some reason or another, have not joined other student organizations and other adult organizations and members of Congress and championing the lowering of the voting age. And I don't think this is coincidental because these people say to young people, quite accurately right now, there's no place for you in the system. So you join our, organ or you join our organization, we're going to destroy the system, and we're going to build another one, and we're going to give you a piece of the action. And it would destroy this compelling reason if the system could respond and could cleanse itself of this inequity and young people could have a, a voice and a reason to sustain and strengthen the present system. I think there's a real consistency there. <laughs> now, I, why, don't we, why don't we share the wealth here and we'll come back and proceed. I don't want to turn you off. Yes, sir. Eighteen, nineteen, and twenty. There are three, three categories. Well, of course, Baker versus Carr talks about one man, one vote, and the, the question involved basic, uh, the basic philosophy of Baker versus Carr, and and the implications that lowering the voting age or direct popular vote, I suppose, would have uh, uh, as they commingle together. Uh, there are some states, as you point out, four states now, who let uh, younger citizens vote. I think, really, we could leave this with the states. And, you know, if, if Kentucky wants to let 18-year-olds vote, and Indiana doesn't. I wish Indiana did. This is one of the first measures I introduced a long time ago, and we got defeated on it in the Indiana legislature. But if the people of my state don't want to lower the voting age, and thus they don't have quite the weight in the presidential election because the 18, 19, and 20-year-olds don't vote, then that's their responsibility to make that determination. But what we are saying, if we go to a direct popular vote, that each state can make this determination for themselves. I don't see this flying in the face of Baker versus Carr, particularly if it's in the Constitution, it, it is the law of the land. Uh, what, what we have in SJ Res 1 right now, frankly, is a provision which says that Congress may by law at some subsequent date provide for uniform residency and uniform voting age, if it so desires. Now, the uniform voting age provision was taken out of the bill passed by the House, and whether we'll be able to get that passed in the Senate or not, I don't know. From a standpoint of 100% justice, I think we ought to have a uniform voting age and a uniform residency. 
But from a practical standpoint, if each state wants to make that determination in the area of age, I'm willing to go along with that. I'd rather have uniform age. Senator Bob. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think you can make a very good argument that as far as governing the presidential election, you should have a federal election law treating every citizen exactly the same. I think you can make a very good argument on that. The question where I began to get a little pragmatic about it, and having it 67 members of the Senate and two-thirds of the House, and three-fourths of the state legislature, how far can you go? I think you can, you can pass a measure that will require uniform residency. I'm not too sure you can now get three-fourths of the legislatures who have not lowered the voting age on their own initiative to adopt a constitutional amendment mandating them to do so. That's a very, that's a very practical argument. What I, I'm trying to sort of be subtle about this in the approach and leave for a later date the possibility of Congress to establish a uniform age and a uniform residency requirement. The House took this out, let me suggest to you. I, I would be perfectly happy with your proposal that everybody's vote for president be gauged by the same measuring stick. But whether we can get that particular uh, degree of legislation passed, I don't know. I would like it. I think it's patently unfair. Uh, look at the residency business. I can see why if I move in here from Indiana and into Los Angeles uh, 30 days before election, maybe I wouldn't be qualified to vote for county supervisor because I don't know all the facts involved. Maybe not for state legislature, maybe not for Congress. But why should I, living in Indiana, be denied the right to vote for president if I just move across the precinct line in Indiana? Which is, this is the way our election law is, is structured. And I think this is wrong. We have literally millions, seven or eight million people every year that are disenfranchised because of the nuances of the registration requirement. Yes, yes. please. Um. Yeah, you have to go to the registrar's office. That's right. You, you're, you're much more progressive in, in permitting this in California than we are in Indiana, but you're one of the few states that do make this possible, let me suggest. No, oh, I'm afraid it isn't. No, the Supreme Court refused to decide that case uh, involving the case that was just before them a couple of weeks ago because the legislature had changed the law and the person who originally petitioned was qualified by the new law to vote. I'd like to see the court say that, uh, that this is, uh, is the law of the land, but I think if you read the, the fine print of that decision, the, the court backed off and, and refused to decide it because it was a moot question. It's yes. been a few years since I've read the Constitution, but you stated twice that uh, how difficult it will be to get three quarters of the state legislatures to ratify an amendment. Isn't there a, an alternative written into the Constitution for ratification, a, a popular vote alternative? Well, you can amend the Constitution by uh, uh, two-thirds of the states petitioning uh, the Congress uh, by petition to call a constitutional convention. That's never been done. The, the uh, great effort that the late Ever McKinley Dirksen has been leading to, to uh, unreapportion legislatures uh, is one one legislature shy of meeting this uh, criteria, we really don't know what you have to do to meet that criteria. In other words, what does a legislative petition, what standard does it have to meet? Uh, I don't know whether you want to pursue that. There is another alternative to amending the Constitution uh, to two-thirds of the Senate and then three-fourths of the states. You can call a, uh, a constitutional convention by a legislative petition and then have the results of that ratified by three-fourths of the state legislature. Then I was just wondering, uh, since our involvement in Vietnam has cost us so much, I was wondering what the level of, of awareness is in the Senate 
uh, in the areas of, I'll say, Africa and the uh, present uh, fights in, or struggles in the uh, Portuguese colonies of Mozambique and Angola and Portuguese Guinea. Uh, these are, you know, these are struggles which Portugal is fighting with NATO weapons, which are supplied mostly by uh, the U.S. and Germany. Uh, and they're, they're being supplied by, the rebels are being supplied by many other countries. And, you know, the whole thing is very complex, and yet I never hear anything said about it on the national scene. And I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, it, it might uh, escalate. Uh, do you have any uh, opinion on that? Uh, yes, uh, I do. I think you have touched on a very, a very uh, pertinent point. I cannot honestly say that in the Senate, or as far as I know, any place in the government except maybe the Portuguese desk or the various African desks at the State Department, there is a degree of awareness involved involving this problem that, that there is uh, involving Vietnam, because we have American young men over there involved and the casualties directly involving the constituents of those in the Congress. So there's not that degree of awareness. I think uh, if you read carefully, you will see that some statements have been made relative to the very problem that you raise, uh, that we are not being consistent in this country by not suggesting to the Portuguese that uh, uh, they do more than they have. We're trying to limit the use of weapons, but I think you're you're accurate, or you didn't exactly say this, but even if the arms aren't those arms that are provided by per NATO per se, arms that are provided by NATO can be used in Europe and other arms used in Mozambique and other places. I think this is bad. I think we should use all the influence we have with the Portuguese uh, to stop this type of colonialistic empire. I think, uh, you know, it's late for us to do this. We should have done more than we have in the past. Yes, please. The question, uh, the question involves a, uh, the aftermath of the uh, Hainsworth uh, uh, nomination uh, relating to the speculation that uh, has been filed uh, relative to the possibility that the president will come up with a man who is even uh, more conservative, more uh, anti this and anti that and, uh, and uh, Clement Hainsworth and uh, perhaps yet meets the standard of being as clean as a hound's tooth, quote unquote, Richard Milhouse Nixon uh, uh, post-election day. Uh, what would the Senate do? What would I do? Uh, I've been asking myself that same question. Uh, I, I believe that much of the speculation which was born during the controversy of the Hainsworth affair was a pure and simple effort to blackmail the members of the Senate uh, to support Hainsworth for fear they'd get uh, a Hainsworth in spades. Uh, for example, one uh, member of the Senate who I think most of you would really uh, admire, uh, who will not be named by me, uh, refused to support uh, Judge Hainsworth uh, on the basic grounds that he had been sold that uh, if Hainsworth wasn't confirmed, John Mitchell was going to be next. Well, I think it's a moot question as to where John Mitchell can do the least amount of damage right now. <laughs> uh, but I think you have, to, you have to fight one battle at a time. The Hainsworth affair was a very distasteful thing to me. Uh, I was concerned, deeply concerned, with some of the judges' votes on civil rights. I was. Uh, I'm not convinced that uh, a good case had been made that uh, he was completely anti-labor biased. This may have been so. Uh, I felt that 
we have to recognize within reasonable bounds the presidential prerogative. Let's face it, I didn't do too much to help Richard Nixon get elected. Uh, in fact, I probably did as much as, uh, as I humanly could running for re-election myself. And, uh, we didn't treat uh, Mr. Humphrey as well as I would like to see him treated in, in Indiana. And I make no bones about this fact. Uh, but President Nixon is the president. And one of the fallouts of our system is that when you elect a Richard Nixon to the White House, you get a Richard Nixon type philosophy on the court, at the Department of Justice, and in the other places where the president has the authority and the right to, to appoint. So within reasonable bounds, I think you expect this. And thus I felt the most telling argument against Clement Hainsworth was the fact that he had not reached or approximated the ethical standard that I think we need in this country on the Supreme Court. Now there, there are limits beyond which the president does not have a rubber stamp right in the area of philosophy. I thought this was most eloquently expressed by Senator Javits when he thought that uh, there were different degrees of philosophical difference that you could have a person who was a philosophical conservative who he could in good conscience support, although he differed with him. But if this philosophy got to the point that it was really flying in the face of history, turning back the clock of history, and indeed directing this country philosophically in a direction that would be disastrous to this country, then he would exercise his right to vote against a man on philosophical grounds. I think this is a reasonable difference, a reasonable distinction. I hope, you know, I, I'm going to face one nominee at a time. Uh, those who say that the only reason there was a opposition to Judge Hainsworth was because he was a conservative uh, really aren't looking at the facts. Uh, there was very little opposition directed at uh, Chief Justice Warren Burger, and he's hardly what you'd call a flaming liberal. Uh, I think if the president comes up with a man who is reasonably conservative, I don't care whether he's from the South, and does approximate that ethical standard that we think ought to be on the court, I think the Senate will uh, advise and consent. Even though some of us may not agree with the, the man philosophically on all fours, that's the way the system works when you elect a man uh, with a philosophy of Mr. Nix. Yes, please. Um, in Kurt Gentry's book, The Last Days of the Lake Great State of California, he raises a problem and an ever-growing one of candidate packaging. And his specific example was the, what Spencer Roberts' agency did in regards to a man who they formerly regarded as a dangerous, rightist extremist, Mr. Reagan. Now, and I do also remember those, quote, open forums that Mr. Nixon put out in the 1968 elections where uh, some kind of guys as to uh, impromptu questions were put out of Would you speak a little louder? I well, th I remember the forums that Richard Nixon offered as far as advertisement for his, uh, his election in 1968. Uh, what kind of guarantees do you see or would you propose that wouldn't infringe upon Madison Avenue's right of free speech that would guarantee that the American people are going to see, really see, the man they're going to vote for or might vote for. I, for one, would suggest compulsory open forums. How about yourself? I don't know whether you could ever be successful in that type of an approach. I think it would be wholesome uh, to have a series of, of debates, whether you call them open forums or whatever you call them. Uh, even if these were not direct confrontations between the candidates, if you had the chance at uh, uh, complete interrogation by an audience or uh, newspaper types, of course, uh, in the last campaign, the forums to which you referred were open forums, but uh, the uh, inquisitors were rather carefully selected. Well, I honestly think you have to be very frank about it. There are limits 
to the amount of protection that this government can give its citizens, and I don't know that there is any way we can protect the average citizen from his own stupidity. I mean, there's no, look, so if, if a fellow is willing to sit there and drink his can of beer and watch something and buy it gullibly, I don't know what we can do about that. Uh, I think as long as we make the opportunity available for the other side to present their issue uh, and to present their candidate, uh, I don't know how much farther we can go. Um, I think the more discussion of this thing, as you bring it out here, I think the more of this we have, the better. Uh, the more we alert the average member of the public to the, the selling of the president, whether his uh, name is Nixon or Humphrey or Johnson or Goldwater, whatever his name may be, both sides participate to a certain degree in the Madison Avenue uh, approach, let's face it. Uh, uh, maybe the present president went a little bit further than others. I don't know. Uh, uh, but I, I think when it gets right down to it, the level of confidence we get in the White House or in the Senate or wherever it might be in the State Assembly is going to be determined by what the mass of the people are willing to tolerate or willing to demand. And well, I don't know how we escape that in a democracy. As much as I might disagree with the philosophies of a Richard Nixon, I hate to judge any man by innuendo and uh, distant supposition. And when the only thing that I'm left, as a, left with as a character reference is flashing back to his appearance in 1962 at the Ambassador Hotel, when he stated at the end of that campaign, now what are you people going to do, now press people going to do, now that you don't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore, and then bring it up to current, current doctrine or current uh, rhetoric when it was uh, rather uh, openly pointed out that a gentleman named Buchanan wrote Vice President Agnew's speech regarding the press. Now am I to judge that we have a scared little man in the White House, afraid to meet uh, newsmen and such. I think we're entitled to something more than that. I would hate to say that he is this, he is X, he is Y, when I don't really know. All I have is these two distant reference points to judge. Well, I think you have a little bit more than that. Let me say very frankly, and I don't want to be argumentative because I believe that you've touched on a, on a good point here. But you know, I, I think we've had a chance to view in person several rather profound statements that have come both from the White House and from the Vice President. I don't think we have to take anyone else's interpretation of these. I think we can weigh them, right or wrong. I think we can listen to what the Attorney General says. We can listen to what guys like Birch Bayh say and others that are in position of greater responsibility. Uh, and then you make your own determination. I don't think you should read a book that's a bestseller or not a bestseller that's written by a campaign aide or somebody who's a self-appointed expert and, and uh, vote accordingly. I don't think you do, and I don't think most people do. And I, I'm not, I don't think we ever want to get to the place where we can say to you or to him or someone else that we're not going to let you express your analysis of what happened. Let's, let's keep everything above the table. Let's let everybody have a crack at an, analyzing it. Let's let everybody be heard. And then we suffer or profit by the judgment of the great masses of the people. This is one of the strengths, and it's also one of the liabilities of the type of system we have, let me say. Yes, please. Um, my question concerns uh, Hainsworth, the Hainsworth decision and also Senate ethics and morals. Um, a few years ago, Senator Thomas Dodd was, he was almost crucified in the Senate because of his, uh, what, what he was doing. And then uh, last week, the major uh, news magazines came out and claimed he was a hero because of his, um, he made his decision on his moral grounds. Well, a few years ago, it was, people thought he had no morals. Well, what, as you, you as a senator, what do you look for uh, in your fellow senators and uh, representatives, considering uh, if he's a good senator or if he has high moral grounds or ethics? Well, at the risk of sounding inconsistent, uh, I must admit occasionally maybe I am. Uh, I, I think that uh, as one member of the Senate, I have a full-time job minding my own ethical standards. Uh, without trying to judge the ethical standards that should be followed by 99 others. Uh, I honestly believe from talking to Senator Dodd that uh, he was deeply concerned over the ethical question and 
made his determination only after convincing himself uh, that uh, somebody was not trying to do a tar and feather job on someone else. He's extremely sensitive about this himself. As far as the area of ethics, my staff's been working on, and I intend to introduce, uh, as soon as we can get things put together, legislation in the area of judicial ethics specifying specifically that you cannot sit on a case if you have an interest, doing away with the vagary of uh, substantial interest, requiring judicial disclosure. These are two things we're working with. How far we'll go, I don't know uh, at this time. Also, I feel if you're going to say let's do more, and here let me suggest, I, I don't want anyone to get the inference that I think that the great bulk of the members or even a significant percentage of the judiciary is unethical. I don't think so. I think most of the judges lean over backwards to avoid conflict of interest, and only rarely do you get a man who is as calloused as the recent uh, nominee. But if you're going to say this about the judiciary, which I think we should and which I think we will, then I think you have to say, what about Congress itself? I think the major determinant, uh, major criteria of a congressional ethics bill is financial disclosure, and that we should require all members of Congress uh, to disclose their financial holdings and their sources of income. Then if you have all of these facts available to the public, when you go to the constituency for re-election every two years or six years, they will be able to determine. And they're rather harsh judges as to whether there was a conflict of interest or not. And I think this is an important criteria. Yes. You're not talking about Orange Cal County, California, I'm sure. Huh? <laughs> All right, that, that's that's a good question. It's one that I uh, I'm glad you raised. Uh, the question basically is, what about the matter of fraud? If you get involved, and don't let me paraphrase this, but I don't want to distort the question. Uh, is a direct popular vote going to increase the opportunity for fraudulent returns to win the presidency? I want to be brutally frank about this. There's no system that I know of that's going to prevent a few unscrupulous individuals from trying to take advantage of it for their own well-being, uh, no matter what it is. And there are going to be a few characters that are going to try to take advantage of the direct popular vote system for their own personal gain. Now, there are Two points, I think. First of all, we need to continue and to increase uh, the job we're doing at policing, at, at guarding the ballot box, at ensuring registration, ensuring the vote count, and this type of thing. But beyond that, I would like to suggest that one of the major deterrents of fraud is to decrease the benefits to be derived from fraud. If you have a system where a little fraud can have a significant impact on the outcome, then you have a system where you're going to have people in this county or that county, whether it's Indiana, California, Illinois, Chicago, uh, uh, New York, uh, wherever it might be, you're going to have people uh, that participate in this type of activity. Let me compare the impact of a little bit of fraud on the present system and on the direct election system, and I, I think you'll see what I'm driving at. Under the present system, let's use the state of California. I don't know whether there's any place like this in California, but I use it because it's the comparison that Ted Sorensen used when he testified in support of direct election. He pointed out that in California, if you are a boss, whoever you are, Republican or Democrat, North or South, and you have the ability either through uh, uh, using aliens or tombstones or residents of flop houses or whatever the various scheme might be, to count 20,000 fraudulent votes. 
that you might indeed, in a close election, affect the outcome of the popular vote in California. And by doing that, those 20,000 fraudulent popular votes could win for your candidate 40 electoral votes, about 15 percent of what is necessary to be elected president of the United States would be bought by 20,000 fraudulent popular votes. So you have a significant clout by those relatively few fraudulent popular votes. But if you have a direct popular election, these same 20,000 fraudulent votes have to be commingled with about 70 million fraudulent, uh, <laughs> 70 million votes. And so you can see that the ability to affect the outcome is greatly diminished in the direct popular vote. Uh, frankly, you know, the best way to provide safeguards against fraud is to have active competition in each precinct. So you have a Republican precinct committeeman sitting there and watching everything the Democratic precinct committeeman does, and the Democratic precinct committeeman doing the same thing. Well, under the present system, there is not an incentive to really count every vote. If you know you're going to lose your state by 200,000, you really don't care what the other guy does, you know. You can't, if you cut it down to 100,000, you're still going to lose the entire electoral vote of your state. Same way if you're going to win. If you're going to win by 200,000, there's no incentive to build it up to 300,000. In direct election, you know that each vote counts in the final total, and I think there's going to be much more significant competition between the two parties and thus better policing, very frankly. Yes? Pardon me, I was being told I've got to leave. Go ahead. What is that? Do I propose any uh, reform in the next Democratic Convention? I surely do. I've been a member of the commission that was uh, mandated as a result of the uh, resolution passed in Chicago. We've met for almost a year now and have come up with uh, more than a dozen recommendations uh, to our national committee and subsequently to the next convention as criteria for the selection of delegates. The three most salient points are that we feel that the process of delegate selection should be made more democratic at the grassroots level so that more average citizens have a chance, full knowledge, and the ability to participate. Second, uh, we feel that the choice should be more timely. Right now there are some states that start the initial selection process two years in advance of the election. When the candidates, uh, uh, the names on the scorecard, the issues are not even pertinent. We feel that this should be made more timely and it should be no earlier than the year in which the election is going to be held. And third, we have established a rather controversial yet strict requirements to suggest that in three areas, uh, Negroes, women, we'd well have to call Negroes and Puerto Ricans uh, the color aspect women and youth, that the delegation from each state approximate the complexion of the state as a whole. So you don't have a state like Mississippi sending a lily white all male delegation of people over 50 years of age uh, to the convention wherever it is. Now, uh, I wish that uh, we had both parties equally concerned about nomination reform. Unfortunately, we've had too many people who say, I don't like any of the candidates. I'm not too sure. In fact, I'd be willing to bet no matter what reform we come up with, there are still going to be some people who lose in the nominating battle who aren't going to be satisfied with the results, you understand. But I think we can make the nominating process more equitable. We can't really do the job that needs to be done until both parties are equally enthused about this because much of the machinery for governing the nominating process is governed by the decision of the state legislatures. And it doesn't make a difference how enthused the Democrats are about this. They don't control very many state legislatures right now, and they're just not going to be able to change the state law. We require in the commission report 
that a good faith effort be made by the Democratic Party in each state, even if you don't control the legislature, recognizing that you're probably going to be defeated, but that the least we can expect is that you make a good faith effort to make that change. Yes. We're, well, while well, you've been waiting very patiently, then we're, I'm going to have to. Yes, sir. In, in lieu of the uh, eventual and seemingly now forthcoming uh, increasing of our intuition here at this school, the University of California's uh, college veterans are very much interested in the legislation that went up to increase our GI Bill by 46 percent. We were really uptight when uh, the President came out and said that he would, uh, he threatens to veto this bill unless it only is a 13 percent increase in because of inflation. Well, one thing that wasn't consistent with us is that last year when he got a 100 percent raise, it, I heard no mention of inflation. And when you senators yourself in Congress got a 41 percent raise, I heard no mention of inflation. Don't knock the senators and congressmen there for you getting 46 percent. So. Well, that's what we're very appreciative of your unanimous vote for our, our bill right after he threatened to veto. But now what we're wondering, and we, ha we get no information on this, We'd like to know when the House, uh, the House appropriated 27 percent, you appropriated 46. We'd like to know and it, where it's standing right now in the joint House sessions are trying to agree on a, the percentage. And also, uh, what do you intend to do for us if the President uh, vetoes this increase for us? Well, I, the first question is they're trying to resolve the differences between the House bill and the Senate bill in conference. Uh, I can't really predict what's going to happen there. I know what I hope is going to happen because I hope the Senate position is sustained. Uh, as to what happens if, if the Senate position is sustained and the President vetoes it, I think that an effort will be made to override the Senate, the President's uh, veto. Uh, I think we might be successful in the Senate. Whether we are or not in the House is another thing. I, I really am concerned about this, and I, I ask you not to consider yourself just in the category as a veteran, but as a student, which is a broader category, if I might say, say so. And I think the, the attitude of the President relative to increase in GI benefits is consistent with the attitude that this administration has expressed in other important areas of education where we are cutting back on student loan funds. We are cutting back on national defense scholarship funds. We're cutting back on economic opportunity grants for underprivileged students to give them a chance to go ahead and improve their li lot and the lot of their family. We're cutting back on funds for libraries, for research facilities. We're cutting back in pediatric centers and all of these things that I think are so critically important that are the best evidence you have that we have our priorities all out of whack. I, I just speak as one member of the Senate, but I think there are a number of us who are determined to do everything we can to do battle on these issues and say to this administration, we will not sit silent while you ram through the Senate of the United States, a measure which is going to spend 7, 14, 21. I, we really don't know how many billions of dollars in constructing an ABM system that's probably going to be obsolete before it's built. At the same time, you're cutting back in these funds that are so vitally needed for the people of the country. I think we, we, we have to keep stressing this. How successful we're going to be, I don't know. But I, uh, I must say, I want our country to be strong. I want it to be safe. But uh, the facts of life, if you're going to be destroyed from within, you're just as dead as if you're destroyed from without. And we have unfinished business that has to be tended to right here. Uh, I, I, uh, wish I had more time. I was told uh, when we started that if we left any later than 10 after 1, there was no way we could catch that airplane. It's now quarter after, and we're just going to have to scoot. I hope you'll continue to be interested. If there are questions we haven't answered, drop us a note, and I hope to have a chance to see you again. Thank you.